That was close. When key road signs like this are destroyed and vandalized, stolen, or obscured, a dangerous situation is created. Are you okay? The general public may take signs for granted until something goes wrong. But county road maintenance employees can't and don't. I'm Ralph Titus. Good sign installation and maintenance means safer driving conditions. It also means a reduction in the county's potential for liability, as Kansas Department of Transportation attorney Dickie Johnson explains. Perhaps the most important thing that cities and counties can do to defend themselves in tort litigation today are those actions which you will take long before an accident occurs and before a person has been injured. For example, governmental entities should have in place systems for keeping track of the signs that they have in place on city and county roads and streets and for making sure that those signs remain in good condition. It is only by having such a system of surveillance and inventory that you can answer the questions that will be posed to you at trial of whether or not, for example, a stop sign was in place on the date that a person was injured. If you can answer those questions and you can demonstrate that your signs did conform with the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, in all likelihood you will be able to prevail at trial. If, however, you cannot answer those questions and you cannot establish that your signs met the requirements of the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, your odds of winning that lawsuit become slimmer and slimmer. Let's see how this county puts Attorney Johnson's recommendations into practice. Raleigh County Public Works. So my son and I were just about involved in a serious accident this morning. Let me get my map, one moment. It was near the Walsburg Church. I believe the intersection was Walsburg Road and Union Road. What was the problem? I didn't see a stop sign. I really feel that one should be put there. Yes, my name is Jamie Long. Okay, and I will go ahead and write this up and hand it to the Road and Bridge Supervisor and he'll take care of it from there. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Go, Ken. Thank you. Two nineteen two oh two. Yeah, Chuck, looks like we got a stop sign down at uh, the Wallsburg Church, probably at the intersection of Wallsburg Church Road and um, Union Road. Could you take care of it as soon as possible? It's called in by the public. This is a well-organized county with two trucks that always carry the key signs and necessary equipment so that they can respond almost immediately to a dangerous situation. But they do much more than that to maintain signs in this rural county. And that's what this video is all about. We'll show you a procedure that keeps track of all the signs in the county and sets priorities for needed maintenance and tracks that maintenance. You'll also see examples of the proper use of traffic control devices and four typical field operations using the appropriate equipment for a specific job, the tools needed, and proper placement of signs. We're going to take a closer look at each of these areas now here at the Riley County Road Maintenance Facility in Manhattan, Kansas. Hi, Ken. Well, Ralph, how are you today? I'm fine. How are you? Sweet. Ken, you've got a big county here, and it's mostly rural roads. I'm curious as to how you keep track of all the signs and markers, and as far as that goes, how do you know when a sign needs to be maintained? 
Our traffic control department makes a regular inspection of all our roads. The low volume roads we do on a monthly basis and our high volume roads we do every two weeks. We uh, also do a annual nighttime inspection visually and drive all the roads. We also back this up with a retro reflectometer test. I won't ask you to pronounce that again, but what is that? That is a, a device that uh, will check the reflectivity of the sign and give us a, a meter reading as how the quality of the sign might be. So after you've determined there's a problem, what's the procedure then? Any of the problems that we find on a and these inspections would be put on a complaint form. So there must be quite a pile of those things. How do you, how do you handle that? Well, the uh, emergencies we take care of as soon as possible. Uh, the other problems and are put on a work order master list uh, from the complaint forms, and uh, we have a large list. And uh, then I assign that to the traffic control foreman, which, uh, which then he prioritizes his work and schedules his work on a daily basis to go to his crew. So by keeping good records of all the problems reported in inspections or employee observations or citizens reports, then you prioritize the needed maintenance, schedule and assign the work, and then record what the job involved and when it was completed. So that must give you a pretty detailed history of about every sign in the county. Yes, it does. And recently we converted all this information to a computer database so we can uh, access it much quicker and easier. Well, Ken, I'll let you get back to work. Thank you very much for the information. Appreciate you coming in. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. The next step is out here. Before going out on the road, the repair trucks need to be equipped with the right signs and, of course, the right tools. All the key signs are kept on the truck, and they require special care. Whether stored vertically or horizontally, the sign face must be protected by placing some kind of packaging or protective wrapping between each and securing them so they don't rub against each other, keeping the packing material dry. A comprehensive list of common and necessary equipment and tools can be found in the pamphlet Maintenance of Small Traffic Signs. However, here are some not-so-common items found on Riley County trucks. Because of the flexible nature of carsonite posts, it's recommended you attach only one blank. On occasion, Riley County wanted the sign to be visible from both directions, so they made this modification. A face was applied to both sides of one blank, and the carsonite post was painted to match. The handle of this wrench was bent to facilitate the installation of tough nuts up next to the post. Tough nuts and Loctite are used with carriage bolts because they discourage vandalism. A looped cable was made so it tightens around a wood post as it's pulled. This device is exactly five feet high and used to check the height of the bottom of a sign from the edge of the traveled way during installation. All Riley County sign trucks are equipped with a ball bank indicator to frequently check curves and turns, and a distance measuring instrument which determines the longitudinal placement of signs. Every truck should have these items for the protection of the crew. Hard hat, gloves, ear protection, back brace, orange safety vests, cones, warning barricades, and flashing beacon. They also carry the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices and the Kansas Handbook for Low Volume Rural Roads. We're going to show you four typical but very important operations. Minor maintenance, sign and post installation, using a ball bank indicator to determine the need for either a curve or turn sign, and if a speed advisory plate is required, and finally, object markers and delineators. For each of these operations, we'll stress conformance to the standards and guidelines in the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the Handbook of Traffic Control Practices for Low-Volume Rural Roads, and the Maintenance of Small Traffic Signs. Minor maintenance is our first example. Chuck noticed this sign en route to another location and has decided to repair it now. Even though Chuck will be stopped for only a few minutes, he follows the appropriate procedure for traffic control. 
He parks in the direction of traffic and as far off the road as possible with the truck's warning beacon flashing. He places an advance warning sign where it can be seen by approaching drivers and sets out cones to channel the traffic around the work area. On low volume roads, that is less than 400 vehicles a day, with speed limits of 55 miles an hour or less, 18 inch cones are used. On roads with speed limits above 55 miles an hour, or when working at night, 28 inch or larger cones with reflective strips are used. Since speed limits, traffic count, sight distance and location conditions influence the kind of safety work zone needed, work crews need to be familiar with the guidelines in Part 6 of the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. The rear bumper is a heavy-duty bumper with a non-skid surface to allow Chuck to safely stand on it. After tightening the tough nut on the carriage bolt, Chuck applies Loctite, one brand of fluid that keeps the bolt from working off. While the manufacturer recommends applying the fluid to both the bolt and nut, be aware that it will make removing the tough nut almost impossible. The job isn't finished until the work has been recorded. This is very important not only to keep the inventory and work schedules current, but also to help protect the agency in any tort liability cases. Replacing a sign and post is our second field operation. There are several types and sizes of posts. Which one is right for the job? Two things must be considered. First, safety. For successful, safe performance, a post must bend and lay down and or fracture when hit without causing excessive damage to vehicles. Base bending metal sign posts have been used for many years to provide effective economical support for signs. A base bending metal post has no built-in breakaway or weakened design. Steel U-posts, standard steel and aluminum pipe posts, square steel tube posts, and X-posts are all base bending metal sign posts. Wooden posts up to 4x4, on the other hand, are considered breakaway posts. Larger wooden posts must be drilled to assure they'll break away when hit. Secondly, whether metal or wooden, all posts must be sized properly based on the type of sign they will support. Here's an example of a table provided by the Kansas Department of Transportation. The appropriate post for each size of sign and the minimum length of post in the ground can be determined. Suppliers also provide similar tables. The guidelines in the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices are based on a typical situation. It states that normally Signs should not be closer than six feet from the edge of the shoulder, or if no shoulder, 12 feet from the edge of the traveled way. In many local roads and streets, particularly in rural areas, these distances would be unrealistic or impractical. And on rural low volume roads with no shoulders and narrow right of way, six to 12 feet would put the signs in weeds and bushes. So the following guidelines should be followed. All signs should be at least two feet outside the shoulder, or if none, two feet outside the traveled way to avoid being struck by large vehicles. Signs erected at the side of the road in rural districts are to be mounted at a height of at least five feet, measured from the bottom of the sign to the near edge of the traveled way. In business, commercial, or residential districts, this height is seven feet. The height to the bottom of a secondary sign may be one foot less than the normal height. A routine inspection found this warning sign leaning over. The ditch was partially caved in, so the new post will need to be driven in a different place. Before any new hole is dug, even if only a few inches from the previous one, you must check with all utility companies. Severing a buried cable could be dangerous and costly. So the sign supervisor called DigSafe, a utilities clearinghouse here in Kansas, before assigning the job to Doug. After detaching the sign, Doug removes the old post with a hydraulic post cover.
The post driver is attached to the crane and elevated so the post can be inserted in the driver. It's good procedure to clean the quick couplings of the hydraulic hoses before connecting. Before driving the new post, Doug measures first the sign, then the post, marking where the bottom of the sign will be. This mark is his guide for driving the post to the proper depth. The new hole will be about a foot from the old one and is within the proper guidelines for distance from the edge of the traveled way. While driving the post, Doug keeps track of the depth and uses a level to make sure the post is straight. When the post is at the right depth, the height of the mark is checked from the edge of the road. It is at the proper level, five feet. The sign is then bolted to the post using carriage bolts, tough nuts, and Loctite. And again, the work is not finished until it's recorded. Here's the procedure for replacing a wooden post. The modified cable is used to pull the broken wooden stuff. The sign is bolted to the post. A mark is placed five feet from the bottom of the sign. The remaining length of the post from that mark to the bottom of the post is measured. This is how deep the hole must be dug if the shoulder is level with the road. If the shoulder slopes downward, a longer post may be needed to make sure the minimum length is in the ground. Before filling the hole, the height of the bottom of the sign from the edge of the traveled way is rechecked. It's very important that the soil be tamped for stability as the hole is filled and that the vertical level is checked. When a sign needs to be placed where there is solid rock, a jackhammer can be used. Or when there is no solid base, such as this area, concrete may be used. Curves in the road, when do they need a warning? And is it a turn or a curve? And what about a safe speed advisory? How you determine the answers to these questions is our next subject. The Kansas Handbook of Traffic Control Practices for Low Volume Rural Roads recommends the use of an advisory speed plate. When the advisory safe speed of the curve is more than 10 miles an hour lower, than the approach speed limit or the prevailing approach speed. This handbook also has a table to help determine when a curve or turn sign is needed and if an advisory speed plate is necessary. When the advisory safe speed of a curve is 30 miles an hour or less, a turn sign is used. When the advisory safe speed of a curve is greater than 30 miles an hour, then a curve sign is used. The key is knowing what the advisory safe speed is for each curve. The accepted practice is to use a ball bank indicator to determine what that safe speed is. When installed in a perfectly level vehicle, the indicator should read zero. Maintaining a smooth and steady speed, several runs are made through the curve. The first run should be made at a speed somewhat below the anticipated maximum safe speed. The subsequent runs at five mile an hour increments. If the ball bank reading of 14 degrees or greater occurs at 20 miles an hour or less, the advisory safe speed is below 20 miles an hour, which means a turn sign is needed. If a ball bank reading of 12 degrees occurs at the trial speed run of 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour, or 30 miles an hour, then the speed at which it occurs is the advisory safe speed and a turn sign is needed. A ball bank reading of 10 degrees at trial run speeds of 35 miles an hour or greater 
indicate that the safe advisory speed of the curve is 35 miles an hour or greater, so a curve sign is needed. The advisory safe speed is then compared to the established or prevailing speed limit. In this case, the speed limit is 55 miles an hour, which is more than 10 miles above the advisory safe speed of 35 miles an hour, so an advisory speed plate is required. Curves, especially on unpaved roads, frequently have their cross sections changed, and that can change the ball bank reading. Every time your grader operator grades a curve, the ball bank reading could change. Because many factors affect the surface of the road, ball banking curves is an ongoing process. All Riley County sign trucks have ball bank indicators mounted permanently on the dashboard, so they can frequently ball bank the curve. Our last field operation involves object markers and delineators. Object markers are used to mark obstructions in or adjacent to the roadway. There are three main types. Type 1, Type 2, Type 3. Type 1 and Type 3 are used for obstructions within the roadway. Type 2 and Type 3 are used to mark obstructions adjacent to the roadway. Here a Type 3 object marker near a bridge abutment needs replacing. For this type of post, a special pilot driver is used to make the hole. A flexible carsonite post is used because it can withstand being hit occasionally by farm equipment. The new post is marked where the bottom of the sign will be. It also requires a special post driver. As you can see, this is a very flexible type of post. Use caution when removing the driver. The post is driven to the appropriate depth for the bottom of the sign to be four feet above the surface of the road. The Type 3 object marker is attached with rivets and spacers are placed between the sign and post. And of course, the work is always recorded. Delineators indicate the horizontal road alignment. On gravel roads, they are the only indicators. We've shown you a system of tracking and recording problems, the signs and equipment necessary for proper maintenance. We've demonstrated some typical maintenance operations following the guidelines in the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And we've also used the Kansas Handbook on Traffic Control Practices for Low Volume Roads. Most states have similar manuals to this. But what makes it really happen? We asked the Riley County Director of Public Works. If you operate a proper signing program, I mean, where you're into signage maintenance, where you, you're concerned about the proper sign, the proper placement of the sign, and then once it's been placed, the proper maintenance of that sign, that is an, is an expensive undertaking. However, if you choose not to do those things, the alternative is even more expensive. And then we also invest fairly heavily in our personnel. Everybody from the people that are doing the design to the people that are actually physically placing the sign in the field goes through some fairly extensive training. So it ultimately boils down to people like you doing this job right and doing it right the first time and doing it every day. Promoting safe driving. That's what sign maintenance is all about.